White House just released a statement that the Employment Act of 1946 has been repealed provisionally. The Employment Act of 1946 commits the U.S. government to creating equal opportunity for jobs in the U.S. We're here to steal time to get the public's opinion on this crisis. What's your name, sir? Edward Rodriguez. Okay. So, what do you think about uh, the current job market? Uh, I don't know. It will be this far right now, but. Uh, <laughs> so, where are you from? Mexico City. Mexico? Yeah. And um, so, what's the job market like over there? Well, it's really bad over there. It is better right here. The economy is bad right here, so it's really bad over there. So, do you think it would be uh, very bad if the job market fell apart here? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. No problem. So, uh, Mr. McPhee, uh, where yes. are you from? Where am I from? I'm from uh, Seattle, Washington. And um, what do you think the job market is, is like in Seattle right now? Well, I, I was talking to a friend about this. I think that the, the newest jobs out there are jobs that are high concept, uh, high touch, high feel jobs. And what I mean by that is jobs of creating, um, jobs of new ideas, the jobs of the 21st century require not just manufacturing jobs, I mean, we're talking about um, jobs where you have to take one idea and marry it with another idea. So I think those are the new jobs, 21st century jobs. So how do you think um, the um, White House repealing the Employment Act of 1946 affecting um, the job market? Well, I don't think it will happen. So I, I, you know, I think that um, Equality is an important thing to consider when you're when you're doing things like employing people, and so there are reasons that we have safeguards in our in our society, and they're there for everybody. Do you think um, the federal government should take more of a stand in um, what they feel about the job market and what should be done like in it? Well, the economy is kind of a a, a very uh, complicated thing. So to say that they need to take a stand, I think you'd have to, you know, do some massive overhaul of our system. And so, you know, currently I think the system works as the system's designed to work. And so that we have unemployment, I think, is by design. Well, thank you very much for your time. And this is Bailey Holmes for Channel 4. Back to you. <laughs> Explain fiscal policy. Well, fiscal policy, by definition, is changes in government spending and tax collections that are designed to achieve full employment and non-inflationary domestic output. But unfortunately, there are some problems with fiscal policy. What are these problems? Well, there are six, and data shows that one of them is timing problems associated with recognition. Another would be the potential for misuse of fiscal policy for political rather than economic purposes. Another would be state and local finances tend to be more pro-cyclical. Another potential ineffectiveness, ineffectiveness if households expect future policy reversals and possibility of fiscal policy crowding out. Is there anything positive about fiscal policy? Yes, Caroline. Fiscal policy can help move the economy in a desired direction, but it can't really bring price stability. But fiscal policy is a valuable backup tool for monetary policy in fighting significant recession or inflation. Well, thank you, Shelby. <laughs> thank you, Caroline. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to this evening's edition of the 11 and a half news, your local economic information news show. This evening we have a very interesting topic. Tonight I will be speaking about the aggregate demand curve, or AD. A fascinating subject. What would you like to pontificate on? Well, I would like to pontificate on the three key effects that affect aggregate demand that I feel the people at home should know about. Oh, I'm sure they will be paying close attention now. So, Virginia, what are the three key effects? The three effects are the real balance effect, the foreign trade effect, and the interest rate effect. And what should the families at home be knowing about these two things? Well, Caroline, with the real balance effect, they should know that the real income and wealth increase due to a decrease in the price level, uh, then consumers will in effect spend more and save less. How does this affect the aggregate demand curve? Well, this effect explains why the aggregate demand curve is upward, sloping upward. The next effect is the foreign trade effect. This effect happens when Americans produce cheaper products than those abroad. This means that you, the American public, will buy more of the U.S. goods and less from abroad. Yay, America! I believe you still have one more of these 
effects. Uh, yes, why well, yes I do. The last one is the interest rate effect. This takes place when the price level rises, which in turn raise the interest rates. The two increases will then lead to a decrease in consumption and business spending. What will also occur is an increase for the demand of money as well as the cost of uh, borrowing. These two increases are due to a high price level. All of this results in a downward sloping aggregate demand curve. Wow, never knew how things like this could affect the aggregate demand curve like that. I bet folks at home are glad you tuned into our newscast. I bet they are, Casey. Anyway, Virginia, don't you have a few more for us on this thrilling topic of Why, yes I do, Caroline. The next part of aggregate demand uh, I would like to discuss are the determinants of it. There are four changes that affect the curve, and within those four uh, are other factors. Which would you like to begin with? Um, I will go with the change in consumer spending. Factors that facilitate a change in consumer spending are consumer wealth, consumer expectation, household indebtedness, and taxes. What is another determinant? The next one is investment spending. The factors that influence investment spending are real interest rates and profit expectations. The profit expectations can be influenced by business taxes, technology, degree of excess capacity, and the expectations of future business conditions. Two more to go. <laughs> Why, yes. The other two are shorter to talk about. They are a change in government spending and a change in net, uh, net export spending. That's all for aggregate demand determinants. Well, thank you, Virginia, for that very interesting and informative news. Now, Casey, what will you be pontificating on? I will be focusing on the determinants of aggregate supply. And what are the determinants of aggregate supply? Well, there are three determinants of aggregate supply. The first one is a change in input prices. The next determinant is a change in productivity. productivity. And lastly, a change in legal institutional environment. What effect does each of these determinants have on the economy? If there is an increase in domestic resource prices, prices of imported resources, and market power, there is a change in input prices, thus shifting the AS curve to the left. When there is a change in productivity, for example, there is an increase in unemployment, productivity will decrease, thus decreasing the aggregate supply and shifting the curve to the left. Lastly, if there is an increase in business taxes and subsidies and government regulations, then there is an increase in legal institutional value, thus shifting the AS curve to the left. What is productivity and how do we calculate it? Well, productivity is the relationship between real output and the amount of resources used to produce that output. To calculate productivity is the total output with total input. We have a visual for the folks back home.
in the aggregate demand curve. This occurs when the supply determinant changes, such as the change in input price, as you described earlier. You know what You paid attention to what I said. I always pay attention to you, Casey. Moving on. Right. Well, what else do you want me to talk about? Menu costs? Please. And there's nothing else. I mean, everyone else knows about efficiency wages and how it strives to elicit the maximum amount of work effort with the minimum amount of labor cost per unit of output in class. Well, that was an exceptionally well done newscast. Thank you for tuning in to the 11 o'clock news. We'll see you tomorrow. I'm Sonia Swick. Econ land has reached equilibrium GDP and is in a closed economy. Here to explain the economic situation in econ land is Dr. Bartholomew. Thank you for being here. Now, Dr. Bartholomew, you are an expert in closed economies. Could you clarify the conditions in econ land for us? Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the economy in econ land is at e equilibrium GDP. That means that the expenditures of the country, which are consumption plus investment, equal the gross domestic product. This also means the savings equal the planned investments. Savings are also called leaks or withdrawals of spending from the income expenditure stream. Currently, there is no overproduction which could result in cutbacks in the production rate, and there is no ex excess of total spending which would otherwise result in an increase in the rate of production. Another important fact to know about equilibrium GDP in a closed economy is that there are no in unplanned changes in inventories. Thank you for that explanation, Dr. Bartholomew. At the same time, market land is also at equilibrium GDP. Now, Dr. Karenina, could you please explain the economy in market land? Thank you for having me on your show, Sonia. Basically, my explanation will be very similar to that of Dr. Bartholomew. But let me address just the differences between a closed economy and an open one. You see, in an open economy, unlike a closed economy, there are imports and exports, with a focus on the net exports. Um, in an open economy, and other things equal, positive net exports increase aggregate expenditures and GDP beyond what they would be in a closed economy. In the same vein, negative exports, net exports, reduce aggregate expenditures and GDP below what they would be in a closed economy. All right, so net exports are just a country's imports minus subtracted from all its exports, correct? Exactly. So what factors affect net exports? Some things that can vary the net exports are prosperity abroad, tariffs, and exchange rates. Well, could you clarify what role the public sector's effect on the economy is? The public sector is the government purchases and taxes. Increases in public spending shifts the aggregate expenditures curve upward and produce a higher equilibrium GDP as a result, while decreases in the spending shift the curve downward and produce a lower equilibrium. All right. That clarified the government spending, but what about taxation? We are all interested in taxes. Well, suppose the government introduces a lump sum tax. Lump sum. A lump sum tax is a tax that yields the same revenue at each level of GDP and is therefore constant, right? Exactly. Yes, well, this tax reduces the disposable income relative to GDP by the amount of the tax. This decline reduces both the consumption and the saving at each level of the GDP. All right, so previously we've had recessionary and inflationary gaps in our economy. What does this mean exactly? Well, you see, with a recessionary gap, the aggregate expenditure curve is below the full employment GDP. As you can see in this example graph, this is our 45 degree line, and the real GDP should have this much aggregate expenditure. But our aggregate expenditure curve is below, and therefore we have a recessionary gap. With an inflationary gap, the inflation aggregate expenditure schedule is above the full employment GDP at the 45 degree line, and therefore this distance is the inflationary gap. Okay, well thank you for this exciting information. Anything else you would like to add? Well, there are s some limitations to the model that I have been explaining to you. I cannot address the price level changes, premature demand pull inflation. There is in fact not even any cost push inflation accounted for in this model. Um, there are limits in the real GDP to full employment level, and this model does not contain the economy's self-correcting qualities which that we have seen in history throughout. Well, thank you for being with us on the show.